Okay, there you go. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. And um, you know, the good news is is that uh, bladder cancer is an interest of mine as well. So I do research in prostate and bladder cancer. Bladder cancer actually is a real hot topic right now. I think you guys all know. There's a lot of new therapeutics being developed and the field is changing rapidly. So uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd just kind of bring up some updates from ASCO 2019 because the field is moving so fast. I think we should probably focus on what's new in the field. Uh, I think most of us know right now the algorithm's still pretty simple for advanced disease. You have metastatic disease, it's still gem platinum. Um, after that, there's IO therapies, 5 FDA approved PD1, PDL1 therapies, and most recently, Ertafitinib was F uh, FDA approved for those who have FGFR alterations, maybe about 15% of the population. Uh, for after the platinum setting. But that being said and done, uh, there's yet no new advances in the neoadjuvant and the adjuvant setting, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These are all fruitful areas that are being investigated right now. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on all the exciting new abstracts that were presented at ASCO. So here are my disclosures and conflicts of interest. And discussion topic. So the first one is going to be uh, a pretty long, old school alliance trial that was done uh, many, many years ago, uh, and it's just basically read out. And this is the addition of bevacizumab to gemcitabine. And what I did is I gave it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and unfortunately they did a great trial, but this was very negative, and so it got two thumbs down. But uh, we'll talk about the details of that. Um, next, I'm going to talk about an abstract uh, that Matt Galski presented with the idea of maintenance uh, pembrolizumab. And so this is a made-up term, line 1.5. But we all know that patients that get first-line chemotherapy, platinum chemotherapy with bladder cancer, you kind of either have a response or you don't. The idea of stable disease is newly introduced in this disease with the IO therapies. But uh, we didn't used to see many stable disease patients. What you would get is you would get patients that respond, and because platinum's kind of tough to tolerate after a while, after four to six treatments or cycles, most patients and most doctors would then say, hey, let's take a break, let's see how well you do. If you relapse quickly, we'll move on to something else. Not that there was many other things until recently, but if you have a really nice long break, we might go back to platinum. And so this just explored the idea of can we introduce the IO therapies earlier than the second line and see if we can get some benefit there with the idea of maintenance or switch maintenance as the term that has been used. And, and that was a positive trial. And then uh, I want to focus on third line and beyond. Uh, as you know, there's really nothing FDA approved for that setting other than uh, ertafitinib, but that's really post-platinum setting at this point in time. Um, and fortimab vedotin is a very interesting drug. Many of you may know it well since uh, this is being developed uh, by a local company, Seattle Genetics. And this looks very, very promising and has accelerated approval status. And we'll see soon what the FDA has to say. So I'll get into uh, the details of these studies. So as I mentioned, this trial was started a long time ago. It was based off of randomized phase two data that Noah Hahn presented at ASCO and published. And, uh, you know, they saw some activity with adding bevacizumab antiangiogenic therapy to gemcitabine and cisplatin. But they also saw a lot of thromboembolic events. And uh, they kind of committed to the idea of moving forward uh, with a phase three trial. And here's the basic design. It was patients who had metastatic or locally advanced unrespectable urothelial carcinoma, no prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease, good performance status, and a GFR had to be greater than or equal to 50 mils per minute. They were randomized to gemcitabine, day one and eight dosing, so two weeks on, one week off, uh, with cisplatin, 70 milligrams per meter squared on day one, and bevacizumab, they used the higher dose therapy, the 15 mg per kg, and then they did bevacizumab maintenance there uh, every three weeks, versus gemcis with placebo. Um, and they looked at uh, treatment until cancer progression, unacceptable toxicity or death, and typical stratification factors with whether they had visceral mets or whether they had prior perioperative chemotherapy, neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. It was a uh, primary endpoint was overall survival. And it's interesting is they randomized 500 patients uh, and they required 450 deaths to detect a hazard ratio of 0.74 power of 0.87, two-sided alpha 0.05, 
And they calculated this to be a median improvement in overall survival from 13.8 months uh, to 18.6 months. So it was a, a little bit of a different uh, statistical power calculation than we typically expect. Nowadays, we have these large randomized phase three trials and these interim analyses where, you know, we're actually, since we have good drugs, we're often seeing benefit at the first interim analysis. Uh, but this was a cooperative group NCTN trial, and, uh, you know, they wanted to have a, uh, I think, a smaller sample size to be able to uh, get a result without committing as many patients. Secondary endpoints were pretty standard, as you can see. And here are the baseline characteristics. I think this is just to show that they were reasonably well balanced. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but it was about 50% ECOG performance as 0, 50% ECOG 1. Visceral metastases, uh, almost 70% had visceral metastases, and it was very well balanced that 13% had perioperative chemotherapy previously. Uh, about 20% of the patients did have upper tract disease. I think that's worth pointing out. But the real interesting thing here is the study enrollment period took about five and a half years to enroll. Um, and it finished enrolling at the end of December 2014, so it just read out here now. So as you can see here, I think the survival curves uh, are pretty straightforward here. Uh, it's hard to discern much difference there. P-value 0.17, and PFS was, interestingly, it's hard to discern much difference here either, but this was technically statistically significant. We see this in bladder cancer trials with anti-angiogenic agents. Uh, there was a dose of taxol plus minus ramacirumab trial in the second line, second and third line that was done that did show a progression-free survival benefit as well. That was not statistically powered for an overall survival benefit, but they did meet their primary endpoint. And again, with bevacizumab, we also see a progression-free survival benefit, but it's small. And this is kind of what we've seen in, in many diseases like colon cancer where it's about a 1.1 month median difference here. And so the argument would be this was not the primary endpoint. This was statistically significant, but it's not clinically meaningful. All right, and this is broken down based on subgroups. I think you can see the forest plots and the confidence intervals all kind of cross one there. So no interesting subgroups necessarily to point out. And this is the resist a valuable uh, disease population, measurable disease population, which was the majority of the patients. And as you can see there, based on CR, PR, stable disease, uh, you really can't denote that big of a difference. There was a numerically higher response rate for gemcis bevacizumab at 40.4% overall versus 33%, but this was not statistically significant. And I think the important thing when you look at a trial like this is what about toxicities? And I think these are all toxicities to be expected. We see this with bevacizumab, thrombocytopenia, hypertension, proteinuria. So no real surprises, I would say, but also no clear benefit here. There were a few grade five events there, or, um, <clears throat> four cardiac on bevacizumab, one acute renal failure on placebo, two grade five infections as well. And so here's my take home points. It's just pretty clear, I think, that bevacizumab doesn't add an overall survival benefit when you add it as first line therapy for metastatic urothelial carcinoma. It does improve progression-free survival, but that's not clinically significant since the median is only 1.1 months. The toxicity um, is basically to be expected, historical toxicities that we've seen with bevacizumab, such as thrombocytopenia, hypertension, proteinuria. So the standard of care remains first-line platinum-based chemotherapy without the addition of biologic agents right now. I will say there probably are patient populations to do gather benefit here with anti-angiogenic agents, and we still don't quite understand that. This has been a tough field to identify predictive biomarkers, uh, but I think that there certainly are patients that do have uh, benefit from anti-angiogenic agents. We just, uh, it's hard to establish uh, the utility of these agents when we don't have good biomarkers for this. Now, the thing I will point out is, is that there are a lot of trials that are ongoing right now in the setting that have a lot of promise. And so although, unfortunately, this was a negative trial, it was a well-designed trial, a well-done trial, but we have a lot of trials that could state change standard of care soon. And here I just highlight a few of them. I think these are four of the largest trials there. So at the top, you see the first trial that I think we'll read out will be dervalimab, tremolimumab, so IO, IO combinations with PD1, uh, PDL1 and uh, CTLA4 combinations. 
uh, versus chemotherapy. The next two trials are basically chemo versus chemo plus IO versus IO alone with atezo and with pembrolizumab. And, you know, we might see something like what we see in lung cancer. It's hard to say, but, you know, chemo IO may become a reasonable first-line standard for patients who are fit enough to receive all that. And then at the bottom, of course, there's an ipinevo combination as well, trial. And so, again, I think we'll see the Derva-Tremi trial uh, data reasonably soon. So the next concept I told you is kind of this line 1.5, and this was presented by Matt Galski. This was also uh, not quite a typical uh, cooperative group, not NCTN trial, but this was the Hoosier Cancer Research Network uh, trial that was done. And what they did is they took patients who had metastatic urothelial carcinoma and at least stable disease, so response or stable disease, and had less than or equal to eight cycles of platinum. So I think most patients probably had four to six cycles or so. And uh, they basically stratified them based on whether they had lymph node mets or not, whether they had response to first-line chemo, whether they had stable disease, and I mentioned stable disease is not that common in this situation, and randomized them to every three-week pembrolizumab up to two years versus placebo up to two years. And that progression for placebo, you can then cross over. What they had as the primary endpoint was progression-free survival using the immune-mediated resist criteria, typical standard secondary endpoints, and they reported these in yellow as the secondary endpoints at ASCA. Baseline characteristics, I think, reasonably uh, balanced as well. What you expect in this patient population, male predominance over females, because this disease obviously afflicts more males in the two to one, three to one predominant um, uh, ratio. Uh, visceral metastases, again, around two thirds of the population. Median numbers of cycles of chemotherapy, five to six cycles, and that's not surprising as well. Objective response rates here. So as you can see here, uh, overall response rates were higher with pembrolizumab, as kind of expected in the 22% range. But you can see that placebo still had a 12% response rate. So on first glance, one might say, well, that looks kind of funny, but you also have to think that, again, like I said earlier, most patients that get first-line platinum either respond or progress, and after you've had four or six cycles and you halt and you put them on another trial, they might continue to respond, right? They might, the disease might continue to regress from that baseline imaging study. And that makes sense because you have dead cancer cells, your body needs to clear that. So it's not surprising that some patients on placebo would continue then from that baseline scan on going and rolling on this trial to have further shrinkage of disease because it's just really uh, exemplifying their previous response to platinum chemotherapy. All right, um, other than that, it looks like pembrolizumab looks better there. Adverse events, any adverse events, you can see uh, not too bad there in regards to pembrolizumab versus placebo. What you do see is a little bit more grade four events at 11%, but that's to be expected that you can see this with IO therapies. Uh, transaminitis, certainly that can be higher with pembrolizumab as you can get a small number of patients that have autoimmune hepatitis, and obviously diarrhea as autoimmune colitis would be the side effect that we worry about with pembrolizumab. And you see rash with patients that get uh, PD-1, PD-L1 therapy as well, and so that's exemplified in this study. Higher uh, dyspnea as well, but again, mostly grade 1, 2. Autoimmune pneumonitis is not that common. And here's the primary endpoint. Um, Progression-free survival, <coughs> statistically significant for pembrolizumab over placebo here. And the median PFS was 5.4 months for pembrolizumab, 3.2 months for placebo, hazard ratio 0.64. So here's my take home. I think that switch maintenance pembrolizumab does delay disease progression in patients who have metastatic urothelial carcinoma. The adverse events, very similar to what one might expect with pembrolizumab in other settings, other cancers that we've seen this uh, used in. But this is a randomized phase two trial. And although very, very provocative, and I give it a thumbs up, it's not a phase three trial. We'll need to see randomized phase three data. This is promising, though. And so there is a phase three trial with this line 1.5, <coughs> the switch maintenance, using Avelumab, another FDA-approved therapy that in the second line and beyond. Avelumab, um, in this study, will also take patients who have response or stable disease after four to six cycles 
randomized to Avelumab best plus best supportive care versus uh, best supportive care alone, which is generally observation for these patients. And this patient has a, a finished accruing already. We're waiting to see results from this. Now, this is a phase three trial, so certainly has potential uh, to change some standard of care there. But I will point out that, as I mentioned earlier, first-line therapy may be changing in the future, depending upon those first-line therapy study trial results. And if first-line therapy includes IO therapy, uh, this could certainly affect this, because if most patients are getting IO in the first line, um, it'd be great if this is a positive trial in line 1.5, but they will have already received, you know, IO in the first line, and this won't be applicable then. So we'll have to wait and see how the field evolves. The last one I want to spend some time with, this is infortimab vidotin. This was for patients with locally advanced or metastatic urothelial carcinoma, previously true to platinum and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and I'm on the steering committee for development of this, so I should disclose that. Um, this is how the drug works. It's pretty cool. It's antibody drug conjugate. I think most of us are familiar with these agents since they're already FDA approved agents in lymphomas, uh, in breast cancer. And the idea is the target here, the antibody, is nectin 4. So this is pretty uniformly expressed on urothelial carcinoma. It finds nectin 4 on the cancer cell and it's internalized. Now there's a linker, a very good linker, that protects a payload that's brought in, and this payload's MMAE which is a microtubule disrupting agent, and it's not activated until it gets into the lysosome where the pH is one, and then it's cleaved, and that's where the chemotherapy is then released. So the idea is you reduce toxicity, you're able to introduce a cytotoxic chemotherapy agent that you wouldn't be able to otherwise because it has high toxicity if just infused alone, brings it directly to the cancer cell, drops off the payload, pretty cool mechanism of action. Now this phase two trial really has two different cohorts, and what was presented at ASCO was cohort one. And so this were patients that had previously treated locally advanced or metastatic urothelial carcinoma and received prior PD-1 or pd one therapy and platinum-based therapy. Cohort two is still ongoing. This is basically for the cis ineligible patients. And we know that there are FDA approvals for the cis ineligible patients for both Prembrolizumab and atezolizumab, so this is for patients who are cisplatin ineligible, received IO in the first line, and then went on to receive this uh, after that. So, but that day is still being accrued, that cohort. Now the dose was 1.25 mg per kg, days 1, 8, and 15, 28 day cycle. So three weeks on, one week off, and that was established from the phase one study um, where the MTD was not reached. Primary endpoint is overall response rate by resist 1.1, is determined independently and standard secondary endpoints, as you can see. So here's the patient disposition. I think this is important to point out that many of the patients at this time of the analysis and at the data lock were still on study, continuing treatment. 16% were still on treatment. 35% had come off or were on follow-up for progression survival. 48% were completely off study. But reasons for discontinuation were progressive disease in about half the patients, only 5% came off for clinical symptomatology. And adverse events, patients about 18% came off for that. So a small number of patients came off because they pulled themselves off or the physician pulled themselves off. As you can see, the accrual occurred pretty quickly here, October 2017 to July 2018. 128 patients enrolled, 125 treated, three withdrew due to, uh, prior to treatment. So the analysis was really based on the 125 patients in the intent to treat analysis. And at the time of this data lock, the maximum time on treatment had been 15.6 months and the patient was still ongoing on treatment. I think that's my patient, he's still on treatment. <laughs> so that being said and done, this is the cohort one demographics and disease characteristics. As you can see here, ECOG performance status of one, 68%, so more than half the patients. That's not unexpected given the patient population. 35% had upper tract disease. 42% had two or more Belmont adverse prognostic factors. And as you can see here, 90% had visceral disease. 40% had liver metastases. So this was a pretty uh, advanced patient population. Now they did present data on pdl one status as well by the combined positive scores, CPS status greater than or equal to 10%. 
as you can see, 35% were greater than or equal to 10%. This makes sense because even though pdl one status doesn't affect response to this agent, you want to really be able to look at specific patient populations, whether they're patient populations that are apt to respond to IO, whether they're patient populations that are apt not to respond to IO. And we do know that obviously, even though it's not clear that pdl one is predictive for this disease, it has prognostic potential. So it is important and interesting to know what happens to those patients when they receive infortimab. Likewise, patients that have received prior taxanes would be something I'd be interested in. Patients who had liver metastases because the liver has a different immune microenvironment, IO tends not to work as well for patients with liver metastases. So here you see the Nectin-4 expression. And if you looked at the preclinical data, you'd say about 50% of patients should have high Nectin-4 expression. Actually, what they found is the majority of patients had that. And so that was a little bit surprising, but that makes it a little bit easier when you're developing an agent that you feel like pretty comfortable you can treat most of the patients and, and uh, have a good chance to respond, that the target is being expressed. Here are the objective response rates. I think pretty impressive for this very late stage patient population, 44% response rates. Looks very similar to what they present in phase one. Complete response rates of 12%, partial response 32%. But again, stable disease, 28%. So it's even, you know, again, stable disease didn't really get a lot of recognition in this disease until IO came around. But again, it's not all just about the response rate. That was the primary endpoint, but there's still an additional 28% with stable disease there. And when you look at the waterfall plots, this is pretty impressive, I think. The resist 1.1 uh, um, waterfall plots with independent review here. Uh, I don't think I need to say too much more about that. I think the picture says enough. Um, subgroup analyses, as you can see here, uh, I don't think we can make too much of the subgroup analyses, but I can say that uh, there's still reasonable response rates to certain populations that don't do as well, okay, especially those with liver metastases. I think that looks pretty good there for the patients who had liver metastases in regards to the response rates and the 95% confidence intervals there. So uh, also similar for those with PDL1 high and low expression. Um, and as you can see there, the, the low expressors actually seem to respond better. But uh, you know, that may also be you know, selection bias there. So we'll see. This looks at durability. As you can see, we always want to see swimmers plots. I think the one thing to emphasize on the swimmers plots are the little blue dots on the swimmers plots when the patient had their first radiologic response pretty early. So I think that's impressive. They respond pretty quickly. And there are patients that are still ongoing with very durable responses. Median dur duration of response, 7.6 months, which again, in the third line and beyond, I think that's pretty impressive since uh, I think most of us look at uh, first line therapy, median survival in the 13 to 15 month range, second line therapy, median survival in the seven and 10 month range. So here, at least duration response for those that are responders, it looks really good. Progression-free survival, you know, this will give you some idea, 5.8 months median for the entire population, 11.7 months median overall survival for the entire population. Of course, we eventually have to see randomized control data to really know what this all means, but certainly for this patient population, it looks pretty good, and this was not an indolent disease population. Treatment-related adverse uh, events, as you can see, not terrible, fatigue, it's uh, mostly some kind of mild things that occur. For instance, peripheral sensory neuropathy. Uh, some people can get some hyperglycemia as well and some rash as well. And uh, you know, in regards to discontinuations, 12% did discontinue for uh, treatment-related adverse events. Peripheral sensory neuropathy was the most common. There was one death, interstitial lung disease. This patient was thought to have PJP pneumonia so not necessarily felt to be related to the, de definitively related to the study drug. In regards to spe some specific treatment-related adverse events of interest, we know peripheral neuropathy can be a class effect with this class of agents, mostly because of the MMAE. As you can see, 50% had any grade, three, only 3% 3 had grade greater than equal to three. Uh, no grade four events, mostly sensory, 48% that had neuropathy at baseline because they had received prior platinum chemotherapy that can cause neuropathy, 48% didn't have any worsening of it. And 76% had resolution or events that were still ongoing at grade one at the last follow-up. In regards to rash, also about half the patients, 12% greater than equal to grade three, 
one case of Stevens-Johnson um, that occurred on the study, and most were grade one. Hyperglycemia, 11% had any grade, 6% grade greater than or equal to uh, three. 68% of the patients with pre-existing hyperglycemia didn't develop a treatment-related event. Only one patient had a grade four event that resolved and no need for ongoing medications. 71% with resolution or improvement at the last follow-up. So this is the cohort one summary and conclusions, and I didn't need to make a separate slide for this on my own because I really agree pretty much with the presentation that Dan Petrolat gave at ASCO. This is a high unmet need. There's no FDA approved therapies really in this patient population. Uh, this is the first novel therapeutic to demonstrate a substantial clinical activity in patients who progressed after platinum and after PD-1, PD-L1 therapy. 44% response rate, 7.6% median duration of response. Responses occurred throughout all subgroups, irrespective of response to prior PD-1, PD-L1 therapy, or presence of liver metastases. Very manageable safety profile, highly consistent with the phase one results that we've seen. And these data support submission to the FDA for accelerated approval. Who knows, we might see that before the end of the year or near the end of the year. If approved, I think this has potential to be a new standard of care in patients who progressed after platinum and PD-1, pd one therapy. So thanks so much, and I'm happy to take questions if we're doing them now. If not, we'll do them at the question-answer session, but I'll turn it back to Dr. Kaki. Thanks.